Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Addicted Mind podcast. Today is episode 13. So I have a great guest today. His name is Dr. John Seeley, and he is going to talk about sex addiction and adult ADD or adult attention deficit disorder and how they kind of work together in the addictive process and how treatment can really help individuals who are struggling with these issues. So I've worked very closely with Dr. Seeley for the the last three to four years, and this is an issue that really changed how I saw sex addiction treatment. Um, really digging in and seeing how if someone is struggling with this comorbid issue, they get the help they need. So I think this episode is going to be very useful for a lot of people in recovery. Um, once you kind of can see how these intertwine and if it's something that you're struggling with, getting a professional consultation is, is going to be key to getting that long-term recovery. So I hope you enjoy this episode. I think it's really um, positive, really meaningful, and uh, it has a real uh, has a lot of great content. So I hope you guys enjoy. John, you want to introduce yourself? Well, first of all, thank you, Dwayne, for having me here. It's a real pleasure, and I'm excited to hopefully share some insights into how this particular diagnosis, ADHD, which is attention deficit disorder with or without hyperactivity. Hyperactivity may not be present. In the old days, that used to be the way it was identified, but we now realize that's less the issue than the inattention. But anyway, uh, let me introduce myself. I'm a uh, just recently retired from being assistant clinical professor of psychiatry at UCLA. I'm also in private practice. I was... uh, the uh, director of the Sexual Addiction Sexual Recovery Program at Del Alamo Hospital for about 15 to 20 years, a program that Pat Carnes originally founded, and I am still following his guidelines from that day forward. He eventually moved on to other uh, venues, but uh, we continue to respect his input. He's a true uh, pioneer in psychology, and by that I mean somebody who's gone into an area that nobody else had before and left a tremendous imprint and import on uh, understanding human behavior, in this case, sexual addiction, which, by the way, uh, sexual addiction may be called a lot of other names, as you well know. Right. Uh, It can be called hypersexuality, problematic hypersexuality, sexual compulsive behavior. So for anyone listening, just be aware there are a number of different uh, terms you may hear refer to uh, behavior that basically involves sexual acting out that causes severe negative consequences to one's life, right. and the person finds it impossible on their own to really curtail or get into true recovery without some help. Right. And for you, I mean, I know your history, I mean, you've been working in this field of sex addiction, hypersexual disorder from the very beginning when this was a very pioneering field. Well, not totally. Pat is the beginning. He wrote the book uh, Out of the Shadows in uh, 1983. Right. So I wasn't. I, he asked me to join in 1991. So it still goes back a while. You're absolutely right. But I, I don't want to sound like I'm in on the ground floor because Pat really did the, the true work. He wrote the book. Mm-hmm. Actually, it was originally called The Sex Addiction, Sexual Addiction, which I have a copy of. Wow. Uh, but then it didn't sell. And to friend, he, he tells the story of being on a plane, having come back from a talk. Yeah. Uh, and somebody suggested that he change the title. He actually had a copy of the book on the plane sitting next to him. So he suggested that he change the name to Out of the Shadows. And, of course, from then on, it sold tremendously. Yeah. But he he had a lot of tough time, just even some death threats writing that book. So you can see this is a very uh, controversial issue for some people. Wow. Wow. That's definitely, yeah. You know, I mean, well, when we bring up sex in our culture, uh, there's a lot of... Uh, there's a, there's a lot of uh, different energies about that. And very much it can so. be very, very yeah. confusing. And so. people misinterpret that people who are treating uh, sex addiction somehow are, are uh, morally, making some moral judgment or curtailing freedom of sexuality, right. which, of course, the farthest, the last thing either any of us want to do yes. is be a moral policeman. What right. we want to do is help people who want help, uh, who have done so much damage to their lives, their relationships, and their own personal happiness that might want some help in in staying clear of something that's really devastating their integrity, their self-worth, and their reputation, and their spirituality, many other things, as you know. The shame shame in this area is profound. So my hope today is to share uh, an issue that uh, is commonly overlooked, or at least used to be, 
right. in the treatment of this, quote, disorder. I'll say, quote, because it's officially not in the DSM-5, even though we've been treating it for 20 years, so I'm treating something that theoretically doesn't exist. <laughs> right. I know. I know. <laughs> it's a little strange feeling, but nevertheless, people keep coming asking for help, so somebody's in distress, obviously. Right. So let's let's define a little, <laughs> let's start with defining a little bit, like when we, you said a little bit early or earlier about like sex addiction or hypersexual disorder. Can you just like for someone who's just um, kind of new to this or doesn't understand that term, can you kind of explain how, how do we diagnose that first? And then we'll talk about the ADHD. Okay. Well, the first diagnosing sexual addiction, there is no special test you take. It has to be a done a careful history by somebody who's experienced and somebody who's willing to take a look at their behavior. But most sex addicts act out against their own ethics and principles. This is very right. important because that's what creates tremendous shame. As a result, you're not, one right. is not going to share it with anyone right. because of the, uh, the nature of the shame. Right. So it's, it's probably the most hidden uh, epidemic addiction in our culture. I would definitely agree with that. And so uh, that's why these podcasts are so helpful for people who don't know where to turn and are really consumed by shame because they're doing things that are against their own ethics principles. In fact, that's why many addicts will say, sex addicts I'm referring to, and by the way, when I say that, I don't I mean demeaning, but it's a, it's a common term we use, uh, say, often, I live two lives. I have my sexual acting out life, and I keep it completely secret and separate from my other life. Right, and, right. And uh, so as a result, it's, a, it's an exhausting ad addiction, creating more and more shame and more and more secrecy, and eventually... Uh, most addicts get caught in some way. They leave a clue or they get caught on their phone or they get arrested or anything that can happen. There's many ways. And then they're facing all the shame and the social consequences at one time, which can be devastating. Yes. Oh, I, it's, it's, it is so much. I mean, that's double life comes crashing down. And um, then that's when, you know, they, they come to us for help. They, they don't know where else to go. That's true. And, and it's, it's devastating to see that side of it. It's yeah, like, and it's important to see that there's treatment. Yes, and, yeah. and we speak about getting into recovery. We don't say recovered because, like any addiction, there's no such thing. At least those of us who work in the field, uh, <clears throat> it would be tempting to say you're recovered, never have to worry about it again. But most addictions have to be managed one day at a time. Yes. So as we say, you stay in recovery today. You take care of tomorrow. When? Tomorrow. Right. So it's it's something that you work on on a regular, ongoing basis with a lot of support. Right. It's really important to understand that uh, that you need some. It's really helpful to have somebody with you on your side. That's right. why there's a number of twelve step programs that help in this area, which of course are free. So it's important to remember anyone listening that you can go to a meeting and be totally anonymous and talk about the struggle and hear other people who are caught in the same web uh, of acting out in a way that has truly uh, damaged their lives and their worth and their marriage or their relationship with themselves yeah and that's and that's where a lot of a lot of people start you know they are uh, getting that help because it's so it's so supportive and, and it really reduces that shame they also get to meet other people who have either gone through or are going through what they've gone through it it really reduces that shame and yeah. and helps them tremendously so i <clears throat> wanted to um because you were we were going to talk about um a specific yes. part of this treatment and, and indeed so and i think in, it's in the process of, I may interrupt you there, sorry, uh, when making the diagnosis of sexual addiction or problematic hypersexuality, whatever the term is, then you want to make sure there aren't any other issues going on, either what are called comorbid, meaning other medical issues that might be involved. So, for example, there might be uh, a medical issue, a thyroid problem, and so you want to whirl that out. There's a number of things that go along with this addiction. It's very rare for someone to have addiction, and an addiction, without another issue going on, right. such as if someone's very depressed. Right. Or they may have several addictions they're struggling with at the same time. It's very rare. And the more addictions there are, uh, it usually implies there's a lot of unfinished business from earlier in life, typically trauma. Trauma is a very common uh, issue among most people who are sexually acting out. Emotional trauma, sexual trauma, physical trauma. Uh, that factor, of course, needs to be looked at as far as any treatment that's going to be successful. Right. And what we're talking about today is another issue that needs to be identified if it is present, and that is ADHD. And as I mentioned earlier, that stands for Attention Deficit Disorder with or without hyperactivity. Right. 
Now, it's a disorder that we're well aware of uh, existed independent, of course, of sexual addiction. But in the more recent years and in my work, I've come to realize that a high percent of people with sexual acting out behavior also have untreated, usually ADHD. And that's an important factor in, in, in securing success in, re, in ongoing recovery. If you don't right. treat that disorder, it makes it very difficult. And when you, <clears throat> when you have, if you have been diagnosed with ADHD, it's important to remember that if you have ADHD, you've had it all your life. There is no such thing as adult onset or you may have compensated for it, but uh, the symptoms uh, usually go way back to even elementary school. Okay, so someone will have this, they've had this their whole life. What are some of the things that they would would resonate with them that would say, oh yeah, I I see this in my life? Like what are some of the well, symptomology? The common things would be, <clears throat> particularly with boys, would be that they were always fidgety, uh, hyperactive in, in their attention. As a result, they academically didn't do very well, even though everyone feels they are quite intelligent. And by mm -hmm. the way, ADHD has nothing to do with intelligence. In fact, most of the people I've worked with are actually quite bright right. or very bright. <clears throat> but ADHD makes it very difficult for someone to pay attention right. unless, and here's the key, unless they're interested. So we call it interested-based performance. So it really is a poor name. Attention deficit disorder, in my opinion, really should be called, more accurately, variable attention disorder. Because right. people tend to think that people with AD can't pay attention to anything, and that is so untrue. If they're interested, such as let's take a child who can't sit in class, but he can sit in front of a video game for four hours and play it without any difficulty with his attention, or another, or in sports, or whatever the interest may be. So it's important to remember that ADHD folks can hyperfocus, we call that, meaning nothing interferes. They go into a kind of a, a focus that even time isn't recorded because they're interested. Right. So ADHD folks tend to find their life divided into things I'm interested in, which means I have no problem focusing. In fact, I hyperfocus to the point that I forget other things. Or the other side is things that are so boring to me, I avoid them. And one of the most common symptoms of avoidance is what's called procrastination. That is putting it off, putting things off, writing my bills, taking care of things that have to be done at work or at home. Or if one is in a relationship, let's say a marriage, it's quite common for a person ADHD, an adult person, to not be able, not listening. And the, the partner is sharing something important and they, they may nod their head, but they're not recording it because they're focusing on something such as a television show or a video or a game or, or playing something in the garage, whatever their interest is. So it's very important when you're around somebody who has ADHD to make sure you have their attention. And that means visual, not just auditory. Right. And I've, I've seen that a lot in, in clients that have come in and their partners feel so much like their uh, their partner isn't listening. They they feel dismissed. and And really the person who has that ADD it's not totally intentional. They don't. They don't actually realize they're doing it. If that makes sense. No, no, no. It isn't intentional, but it's broken up many a marriage because yes. the the person, who, the non ADHD spouse, thinks you don't care, you don't listen to me. Yes. I tell you these things. I don't mean anything to you, and so become very hurt and cover it with a lot of anger. But often the person never heard it at all. You told me that. You said that. Yes, I've told you that five times. Right. And by the way, just a sidebar, you mentioned ADD, and just so the listener knows, ADD and ADHD are exactly the same thing. We just oh, okay. do a shortcut. We leave the H out because many adults don't. Most, let me say it this way, most people outgrow the hyperactivity, at least outwardly, by 13 or 14. So we uh, tend not to see it in adults, although it can still be present. Right. And more interesting, also, girls typically rarely have AD, rarely have hyperactivity. Excuse me. Girls rarely have hyperactivity, even in childhood. So they often do not get diagnosed because you can't spot it. Right. Like you can't a boy who's up and out of his seat and running around and can't sit still or focus. So unfortunately, that's how many children are identified of, from the hyperactivity, not from the inattention that is far more devastating to one's uh, performance academically or in personal life. So when, they're, so when people are coming in for treatment, um, this is definitely something that is kind of a must 
a must kind of scan. It is. I think it's something, and you, when you say must, it, it should be included in any evaluation of somebody who has sexual acting out behavior. Okay. For number one, there is no specific test. It's all based on questionnaires from people who know the person with ADHD, the person themselves. Getting a history is very important. As I say, it goes back into childhood. They'll often describe difficulty academically or socially or be picked on or they would they would talk over people or they would have trouble keeping friends because people would roll their eyes. They're not talking appropriately or they're very impulsive, another factor. And so they and they're also very impatient at times, especially in adults driving. They can be very uh, explosive, can have a real temper. <clears throat> so. To, the real issue is making sure it's part of any evaluation. And that, as I say, is no, there's no specific test. One needs to take a good, solid history mm-hmm. and to do a number of questionnaires that can help. And then the treatment is actually relatively straightforward and simple. There, uh, there's a lot of tools, one of which is medication, and it works very quickly and, in my opinion, very safe. It, it needs to be started on very low, sl- and you slowly increase the dose to get a response. Typical side effects of the, of the stimulants are uh, difficulty sleeping mm-hmm. and can suppress appetite. So one has to water, watch those very carefully. Uh, but also another sign that you may have struggled with uh, attention deficit disorder, ADD, uh, even now is that, you're, for example, you're using stimulants to keep focusing, such as commonly coffee. Not unusual for ADHD folks to say, oh, I have two or three pots of coffee a day. Yes, I've seen that. Or, the, or there's uh, energy drinks, those monster well, energy now drinks. Now they're or... capitalizing monster drinks, five-hour drinks, all, of course, add to the, 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 uh, the intensity of the, of the stimulant. So, right. By the way, cigarettes also have stimulant. Nicotine okay. is also stimulant. So it's not uncommon for people with ADHD to be heavy coffee drinkers, smokers, uh, and therefore cocaine abusers. Many of my patients said, I didn't use cocaine to, uh, to get high. I just use it to focus. I right. could really get a lot done. Right. I wasn't partying. I could really. So there's where the stimulants and the medications we use are also stimulants. So the stimulants really help one focus. And the focus that takes place, just so you know, is in the frontal part of the brain, the part of our brain up above our eyes. That's called the prefrontal cortex. And that's where all our decision making, our focus takes place. And that's where the stimulants also activate. So it's strange to think that you would take a stimulant and actually calm down. But actually the reason you're calming down is because you're stimulating the prefrontal cortex that helps you focus, follow, track things that are normally boring or have been boring, and get paperwork done or things that just don't interest you. Wow. It really isn't necessary in the area you're performing in. Uh, you don't need medication for that part. I'll right. say it to a, a say it's I see children as well. Uh, do you need do you need any medication to help you play video games? And of course, the, there's a big laughter because right. the parents say, "No, that's all he does," because he's interested, and that's the connection to sexual addiction. Mm. If you're interested in something, and right. sex is usually pretty interesting to many people, right? Most people, most people, indeed. So, uh, as a result, one can get caught up in that hyper focus mode. And spend hours, as we now know, watching pornography or there's, prior to that there were magazines, but now it's mostly internet porn, which is probably one of the biggest ways that sexual addiction presents. Yes. But it's done secretly until the wife or the spouse, whoever it is, parents, whatever, discovers employer. it. Or employer, exactly, thank you. Treated many people. And by the way, ADHD and sexual addiction are legal opportunities. They can apply to anybody at any age, any profession, doctors, lawyers, uh, uh, people that work on the line, it, it, it doesn't matter. This, this is not for a certain type of people. Anyone is susceptible. And, and uh, remember ADHD. I do not remember. I haven't mentioned it yet. But ADHD is highly genetic. It's one of, most, one of the most genetic disorders we have in all of medicine. So as a result, if you have a history of it, in terms of your parents or a sibling, you may perhaps have it yourself. It means you need, it would help be evaluated. And again, many people have compensated. So they, for example, girls typically, because they're having trouble uh, being organized and getting things done in that homework, they'll stay up till two or three in the morning and pull down great grades saying, well, she couldn't have ADHD. She's getting A's and B's. Right. But the answer is yes, but do you know what it takes to get those A's and B's? She has to be up every night till two or three in the morning. Boys typically aren't willing to do that sacrifice. 
girls typically more, although that's terribly general, but that's just a general concept of why girls tend not to get diagnosed until they themselves get married and have children, and then often their children are identified as ADHD, and they will say to me, you know, Doc, I shouldn't have done this. I tried some of his medication, and I had an incredible day. I, I went to work. I was able to get everything done and accomplished, and half the time I'm so efficient. Right. So that's how they often get diagnosed. It's very common for me to treating children that one of the parents, typically one of the parents, has it almost, almost in all cases, and occasionally two parents, both have it. And then they see it, and then it really helps them. So kind of going back, when these two, when you have ADD and then the addiction, how do they work together? You were kind of mentioning early that you get hyper-focused, especially like in pornography. Right. And <clears throat> Again, remember, performance-based, uh, pleasure-based performance. So if you're interested or pleasured by something, as I say, you have this remarkable ability having ADD. And this is where ADD can be an asset if you're going to focus on something that's healthy and productive. But because sex can be so interesting... That and and compelling, especially on the internet, where it can keep flashing pictures. In fact, most addicts uh, who have ADHD can actually say, "I've already seen that picture," and move on to the next one and classify them and keep them in all in order. Which is strange because most people with ADD otherwise have very poor executive function, which means it's difficult for them to have their day in, in an orderly way, get things done promptly, get com- get things tasks done. Uh, not for be for so forgetful. Those are all traits of typical ADHD folks. So in this case, uh, it's something that interests them. And again, they're high. By the way, at, uh, both the sexual addicts and ADHD folks are extremely visual. As okay. a result, that's why uh, porn or porn on the internet, or for that matter, and the other way you're looking at it is is very very. Uh, captivating and uh, seductive. Right. What, I, have, I have one more question. What about like um, impulsivity, like the uh, the ability? Does does that is that part of the 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 ADD, the impulsive nature yes, of like is. not being able to right. say no, I don't want to do that. Or right. Well, and those are the big three. I'll just review those with you. ADHD really has three components. One is inattention or high distractibility. The second is hyperactivity, which we've mentioned, and the third, impulsivity, right. meaning uh, acting without thinking. So a lot of sexual acting out, of course, is done without much thinking because some of it just doesn't make sense. What were you thinking? People will say, I don't know what I was thinking. I mean, it's, it's hard to answer the question because it wasn't thought out. And so it's very common that sex acts do get caught because they did something impulsively or said something impulsively. Right. And once you understand or, or appreciate sex addiction, you can't read the media or the newspaper ever the same again because you'll see it in almost every day there's somebody who's getting exposed or revealed as far as having a sexual acting behavior. Right, definitely. So when they start to get, um, and what I've seen, you know, some of the, the clients that I've had that you've been able to work with who have been treated for ADD, adult ADD, that impulsivity, once they're in that treatment, that Im- impulsivity goes down. So they, they it tend to... Indeed. And their ability to focus goes up. Yeah. And their partners almost always come in and go, oh my gosh, I can tell when he's taking his medication and I can tell when he or she is not taking his medication. I, I can totally tell the difference. That's very commonly said. Because the medicine, when it works and it clicks in within a few, half an hour, an hour, depending on what meds you're using... And then, and then uh, it is extraordinarily, you're so much aware. Even the person who's taking it says, I can get so much done. But other people say, I can tell when you're on it and when you're not on it. Right, right. Now, it's not addictive. In fact, the medicine stops every day. You have to take it again or you're right back where you started again. I say it's similar to wearing glasses. When you wear glasses, you can see a lot better. <clears throat> you probably can still see without them. And you've learned how to do it before you got glasses. <clears throat> but this is like glasses for the brain. Taking the medication can make such a difference. And I was making the analogy between wearing glasses for your eyes and wearing glasses for your brain. This is similar to that in the sense if you don't take the medication that day, you're right back where you started again. These medications don't cure ADHD. They treat it. Just like sexual addiction, we don't cure it. We treat it. As Matt, Therefore, it's something you work on, or as we mentioned earlier, every day, one day at a time. What I've seen, too, is sometimes... 
clients come in, they, they don't want to take any medication mm-hmm. for whatever reason. Exactly. But I've seen with people who are struggling, well, you know, I, I see that, okay, ADHD is a problem. It seems that it really hampers their recovery efforts. And then, you know, it, it takes them a lot longer to get into recovery or they keep kind of falling off the wagon. Slipping back into addictive Slipping, behavior. Yes, yeah. it's very common. Again, I do appreciate anyone obviously doesn't want to take medication. Yeah, I always yeah. respect that. And I can understand their reluctance to look at something that's, that's that potentially has got a lot of negative publicity. It should be always done under the advice and, and careful Definitely. monitoring of a physician who has skill in ADHD. But the uh, the help it provides in getting in maintaining recovery is is so important because they can sit in a classroom or with a therapist and actually pick up what's happening rather than get distracted or be thinking about something else that has nothing to do with what's being said. Therefore, they're not learning anything. And so they're, as I mentioned earlier, the medications allows one to be so efficient in getting things done and done well. Very important. So medication is an important tool. Again, uh, for somebody who's reluctant, and I appreciate that, I will often have, offer them the opportunity to try it for just one week and then make their decision. If they truly have ADHD and we have the right med, of course, it is day and night. They'll say, oh, my gosh, I can't believe this. That's what I found, too. So, so usually most people aren't afraid to try something for a week. And so that, well, if you can make that bargain, then let's see what happens. And then you make your own decision. Decide. Yeah. yeah. And, it, and it's, um, you know, I, I'm so glad you're talking about this because I, I think this is so important in in treating specifically like sex and porn addiction i I don't know about other addictions but uh, you know sex and porn it's like if this component if if someone's struggling with this and it it doesn't get addressed it makes their recovery so much harder and that's very true it's almost overnight you know i I have times it is it is a little dramatic it it is it's like you don't expect something to be that effective that rapidly yes so it's a it's one somebody listening to this may say well, that doesn't make any sense, but it really does, it, and that's why you can try it in a week and get the sense of like, oh my gosh, and it really. And by the way, people with ADHD, independent of sex, have a lot of other addictive issues. It's two and a half right. times greater incidence of alcohol abuse, uh, not to mention cocaine, crystal mm-hmm. meth. Those are all stimulants. So it's quite common to see these other addictive issues with people with ADHD as well. Marijuana, by the way, is not a not a a stimulant, but it is the number one abused medi- drug with people with ADHD. And I think that's because people with ADHD also describe an inner restlessness that uh, okay. the uh, marijuana helps them with. Ah, uh, okay. That's interesting. Which may be a leftover from the hyperactivity that we don't see outside, but it's still going on inside. It's internally. Yeah. Okay. You know, and I also think, one other thing I think is really, one. I also see in clients who once they start dealing with their their adult ADD, there's almost some relief because they feel so bad yes. about their inability to pay attention. They feel like something's wrong with them. And, yeah. and once they see that, oh my gosh, it's not all me, there's something going on here and they get it treated, that in and of itself has a profound effect yeah, on yeah. their well-being. Well said. In fact, there's a popular book out, I'm... I, you mean I'm not stupid, dumb, and lazy? That's how people with AD often get labeled. Yes. Because they're actually very bright, as I mentioned, sometimes brilliant. You can see it when they're focusing on something they're interested in. Mm-hmm. Say, how come he couldn't do that over there? But that's because he's interested. It's that simple. If you're interested in something, I mean, most of us do better when we're interested in something. That wasn't unique to people with ADHD. But in people with ADHD, it's profoundly obvious that how well they do when they're interested. We all have to do things that we're not interested. We have to pay bills. We have to do paperwork. We have to clean the car, whatever things we don't particularly want to do, clear the windows or do cleaning and dusting, whatever it might be. But we do it. Yeah. But yeah. people with ADHD just found it, find it so difficult because it is so, and the word they most commonly use is boring. It is yes. so boring. I go to a movie, I get so bored because they can't pay attention to the movie unless it's action, action, action to keep their attention. Or mm-hmm. sitting in a lecture or listening to music. If they're not interested, it's just they're loose. Or listen to their, having a conversation with their wife. They get bored and they start thinking about something else. And, and that's where the medication uh, uh, helps them reduce the boredom so they're able to be highly efficient in getting what done, including their recovery. 
So if someone's struggling, I guess I would say get an evaluation if you think this might be yes. an issue. Yeah. Um, there's definitely hope. Especially if there's a family history of it, especially if you had trouble with it in childhood, adolescence. You always felt somehow you were you, you realized you were as bright as anybody else, but why are they doing better than me? That's a very common experience. Gosh, I'm smarter than they are, and they're doing better than I am. And that's because their executive function, that is the ability to actually use their intelligence, is impaired because they get so distracted by something else that interests them. It's not like they're inattentive. They're attending to something else. They're always sharp, folks, but it right. not, may not be what everybody else wants them to focus on. It's not that the brain turns off. It just turns over and looks at anything as the joke goes, anything shiny. Right. But anything that is a, that's in, in, to that particular person is interesting. Of course, child, uh, porn and, and uh, from a child standpoint, anything that's shiny, but from an adult standpoint, porn would be a pr- great example of something that's uh, pretty easy to focus on mm-hmm. and focus on extensively. Definitely. So um, one more question. So if someone's out there listening to this and they relate to this, what would your one piece of advice to them be? Well, if they're in therapy, to ask their therapist for an evaluation or refer them somebody that could do it. If they're not in therapy, uh, to ask around for a doctor who has some expertise in, because many doctors unfortunately don't know much about it or don't even believe, quote, believe in it as if it's a religion. So they don't have any, there is no such thing to it. So be prepared if somebody, you may be surprised some professionals will say it doesn't exist or it's just made up. So doctors make a lot of money or something. I don't know, it's a bizarre kind of response. But once you've seen it, and once you've seen it respond to medication, there is no doubt it exists. That's why I'm saying, look at the yes. proof. The proof is in the pudding, if you allow me a very old quote, that you actually see it when you take the medication. But you do need to be diagnosed first. We don't just throw medication at everybody and see if you'll do better, because some people who don't have ADHD will do better with it, too. Right. I mean, it's like, uh, you know, if you wear, read magnifying glasses, somebody has perfect vision can still see improvement. Exactly. So that's not the way you diagnose it. You diagnose it with a history of struggling with inattention, impulsivity, hyperactivity, uh, difficulty in relationships, and, and very commonly, as we're talking today, having addictive issues, in this case, sexual addiction. But it can be a number of addictions. It's not unusual for right. a person with ADD to have several addictions they're struggling with. You know, Doc, I went to the, the bar to, just to, to, to meet a girl for sex, and I started drinking again. I went to the bar to have a drink, and I met a girl and started sexually acting out again. So there are many doors into the same room of addictive behaviors. So go go get help, and and there's support out there. Yeah, there's groups and, out there. Yeah, and, and find somebody who knows something about it. I'm repeating here, but it's very important to get a doctor who honestly believes there's such a disorder mm-hmm. where they're, they're going to make you feel even more ashamed that somehow that doesn't exist. It does exist. It's a part of the, the psychiatry. It's one of the most common disorders we treat in the psychiatry. So getting help and asking for help, it's very hard to do. Addicts typically have trouble asking for help. Right. So the slogan you is help, ask for help, and help only when asked. Right. Addicts tend to also be very quick to be codependent and help other people out and not take care of themselves. Well, I want to thank you for giving us your time and, and your expertise and your, your passion, wisdom, and hope. On this podcast, I really, really appreciate it. But it's been a pleasure, and I hope it uh, helps someone out there listening to, to get some help if they need it. So thank you so much. So if, if you're listening out there, uh, you can go to theaddictedmind.com forward slash 13. Um, we'll have the show notes there. We'll put a rundown of everything that we've said and uh, go check it out. So thanks, everybody, and I'll see you guys next week. Thanks, everyone, for listening to this episode of The Addicted Mind. You can get all the show notes at theaddictedmind.com forward slash 13. Um, We'll include all the show notes there, any information, and uh, go there and check it out. Also, if you're enjoying this podcast, please go to iTunes or Stitcher, leave a review and rate us. That really does help us out. And also, once again, if you have any questions that you want answered, please go to the website on the side is a thing where you can um, leave me a voice message and I will try to answer your question or find an expert that can and feature it on the podcast. So I'm really excited about that. Also, please uh, look, uh, if if you're active on Facebook, join our Facebook group. It's the uh, Addicted Mind Podcast. 
and uh, just look that up on Facebook, join and uh, be part of the conversation online. Okay, take care and have a wonderful day and I'll see you next week.